Okay, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, <coughs> hope you're enjoying your, your lunch. Uh, I'm Cliff Buddle, uh, <coughs> one of the journalist governors. Uh, welcome to uh, the FCC. Uh, I'd like to uh, extend a welcome to uh, our guest today, uh, Max Hastings. Looking forward uh, to hearing what he has to say. He's written 26 books. His portrait of the Second World War, All Hell Let Loose, has been described by Dominic Sandbrook as the best single volume history of the war ever written. Uh, I've read that he writes 2,000 words every day before breakfast. Should put us all to shame. I don't know if that's true. Perhaps he can tell us if it is. Uh, certainly, he likes to write everything, uh, sorry, to write something every day uh, in case he wakes up one morning and finds he's forgotten how to do it. Uh, Max will be uh, talking to us uh, uh, about the subject of his latest book, The Secret War, Spies, Codes and Guerrillas, 1939 to 1945. He'll be examining the role played by espionage and intelligence in the Second World War, uh, the lessons we can learn from that uh, and its relevance to conflicts uh, in the world today. Uh, this subject has been, uh, <coughs> of course, uh, much debated, uh, featured in films uh, and books in recent times, so very interested uh, to hear what Max has to say about it. So I'd like to welcome Max Hastings. Thank you. Thanks so much for that, Cliff. Um, the one bit you should have mentioned is the fact that when I did walk into Port Stanley in 1982, afterwards the parachute regiment said they bitterly regretted the Argentines hadn't shot me. Um, I first had the pleasure of uh, uh, drinking in the FCC back in 1970, when Richard Hughes was the sort of resident pillar of the place, and uh, uh, it was in a rather different building from this one. but. Um, Things have changed a bit, but in, in some ways not as much as one might think. Anyway, it's a huge pleasure to be back here now. Most of my working life these days is spent writing books about wars, and most recently about spies, code breakers, and guerrillas in World War II. Now, that may seem a long day's march from the business of most of you today, um, but this afternoon, I'm going to talk a little bit about my book to suggest to you that some of its themes about the gathering and the importance of intelligence are closer to your lives and to our modern world than you might at first suppose. Forty years ago, um, I made a study of the Israeli army for which I visited its commando school. And the instructor who showed me round said, he said, you know what we mark most highly for here? And I said, no. He said, telling the truth. He said, we've decided that many, if not most of the things that go wrong on a battlefield happen because somebody who's supposed to be at position A is actually hopelessly lost at position B, or who's supposed to have captured position X is really still at Y. So we tell our students that we'll forgive them absolutely anything if when they're reporting by radio, they tell us the exact truth about their situation. Now, it seemed to me, ever since, that this is a pretty good principle for life, in peace or war. Lie to others if you must, but never lie to yourselves. Think of all the nations, the companies, not to mention banks we know, that in very recent memory have found themselves floundering up to their lipsticks in a swamp because they lied to themselves about where they were sometimes on a gigantic scale. They fail to use their knowledge, their intelligence. In World War II, intelligence became the struggle's growth industry. Never in history had nations devoted such resources to securing information to empower their armies, navies, and air forces. The Americans alone spent half a billion dollars a year, which in those days seemed like serious money, on so-called SIGINT, signals intelligence. Like advertising, much of this was wasted, but nobody at the time could figure out which parts. I've suggested in my book that perhaps 
one thousandth of one percent of secret source material changed events on the battlefield. But that one thousandth, especially about the locations of enemy warships and the struggle at sea, was so precious that no nation grudged a pound, ruble, dollar, rice mark, yen expended on securing it. The key issue was to make good use of the information. Donald McLaughlin, a British journalist who became a naval intelligence officer, wrote after the war, intelligence has much in common with scholarship, and the standards which are demanded in scholarship are those which should be applied to intelligence. After the war, many German generals blamed their defeat on Hitler's refusal to do this. Good news was given priority for transmission to Berlin, while bad received short shrift. Before the invasion of Russia in June 1941, the German high command produced estimates of alarmingly impressive Soviet arms production. Hitler dismissed the numbers out of hand because he couldn't reconcile them with his contempt for everything Slavonic. Field Marshal Keitel, the Nazi defense chief, eventually instructed the army to stop submitting intelligence reports that might upset the Fuhrer. By contrast, the Western democracies profited immensely from their relative honesty. Winston Churchill sometimes vented spasms of anger towards those who voiced unwelcome views, but in general, a remarkably open debate was sustained in the Allied corridors of power. One key reason the democracies did intelligence better than dictatorships is that they gave such license to clever civilians, people admitted to the corridors of power and to the secret world solely for the duration of the struggle. Almost 40 years ago, when the first volume of the official history of British wartime intelligence was published, as a very green young journalist, I went to the launch party and I rather diffidently approached the chief author, Professor Harry Hinsley, who was himself an old code breaker, a veteran of Bletchley Park. I said to him that his book seemed to show that the amateurs did much better in intelligence than did the Secret Service professionals. Hinsley answered somewhat impatiently, of course they did. He said, you wouldn't want to think, would you, that in peacetime, the best brains in our society were wasting their lives in intelligence. Now, I've always thought this important. Before 1939, most secret services got by, or at least did little harm, run by second-rate people. Once a struggle for national survival began, however, intelligence became part of the guiding brain of the war effort. Battles could be fought by men of limited gifts, the virtues of the sports field, fitness, nerve, physical dexterity. But intelligence services suddenly needed brilliance, and Britain was the place where they got more of this than anywhere else. Alan Turing at Bletchley was the foremost example, of course, but there were many others who were not far behind him in intellectual gifts, most recruited from Oxbridge, and all of them the sort of people who would have jumped in the charwell rather than work for the Secret Service in peacetime. That point has a relevance today in the new world in which we live, of which yesterday's events in Brussels are a very striking manifestation. In most respects, we're much more fortunate than were our grandparents. Although we face threats to our society, these are not, thank goodness, existential, though Britain's Prime Minister sometimes foolishly uses that word of ISIS. Our young men and women are not required to don uniform and take up arms to fight for years on foreign fields and see anti-aircraft guns and barrage balloons in Hyde Park. I find it hard to believe that we shall again witness collisions between the great powers which involve massed armies of millions. But international clashes there are and will continue to be. Cyber warfare, which is the logical evolution of the wireless struggle which began in the two world wars and in which Bletchley Park played such a brilliant role, is almost inevitable. It's shocking that so many great companies around the world are grossly inadequately protected from cyber attack. 
their managements will one day have a lot to answer for unless they change their ways in haste. Whereas a few generations ago, our forebears were defended by spitfires and citizen armies, today the intelligence services and eavesdroppers of GCHQ are in the front line against our enemies. I find it almost incredible that civil libertarians wax so wrathful about interception of our communications and amazing that Apple, in a dismay of awesome hubris, should go to court to resist the FBI's current request for its assistance in decrypting the phone data of a dead terrorist. Personal liberty never has been and never can be an absolute. A balance must always be struck between the rights and privacy of the individual and the requirements of restraints and intrusions to protect society. It seems to me droll that today we rightly celebrate as heroes the men and women of Bletchley Park who penetrated Germany's communications in World War II, yet some people view with morbid suspicion the activities of GCHQ in trawling British people's phone and email traffic for evidence of wrongdoing. I would demand of the critics, if not by these means, if not by trawling so-called bulk data, then how else can the security forces detect terrorists? It's almost impossibly difficult for agents to penetrate Muslim communities in Britain, and MI5 receives dismayingly little help from them. It's unlikely that beat policemen who no longer exist in Britain will glance over a garden fence in Birmingham and spot conspirators concocting a bomb our tolerance of electronic surveillance subject to legal and parliamentary oversight seems a small price to pay for some measure of security against threats that nobody today of all days can doubt are real and that will persist. Moreover, to return to my earlier point about talent or lack of it within the security services, what has changed today since 1939, is that MI5, MI6, and GCHQ need brilliance all the year round. The old clear distinction between a state of peace and a state of war has vanished, almost certainly forever. We and our children and their descendants will exist in a new world in which, please heaven, they will not face all-out war, but also one in which they will never know absolute security and over which terrorist attack will cast a continuous shadow. The British intelligence services today have some very able men and women, um, as I can testify because I met some of them. But the people conducting intelligence analysis for us in both Britain and the United States are not of comparable quality with the civilians in uniform who did the job in World War II, who were then the brightest and best. Modern Whitehall pay scales are a chronic handicap to recruiting lineal successors to Turing and his kin. At GCHQ recently, I was told that the shortcomings of the modern British educational system pose a real problem in recruiting young men and women with the qualifications, especially mathematical, to handle decryption and analysis at the highest level. Britain's security services have been astonishingly successful in frustrating terrorist plots against us, but they themselves emphasize that they cannot expect to continue to be this fortunate indefinitely. Nobody sensible in Britain would be smug for one moment after the events of recent months in France and Belgium. Sooner or later, some atrocity will be perpetrated in Britain, and when it comes, we shall need to display the courage and coolness to remind ourselves that for all its horror and the cost in innocent life, the terrorists can only cause us pain and grief. They're mostly incapable of destroying our polity, as Hitler and Stalin could have done. But for all the successes of domestic intelligence, 
the West is much less well informed about our enemies abroad. I see my military friends on both sides of the Atlantic constantly wringing their hands about our relatively low level of knowledge of the tribes and factions struggling for mastery in Syria, Iraq, Afghanistan, Libya, and elsewhere. A deficit in language skills is a serious factor here. Just as important is the willingness of governments to assess intelligence honestly. The issue I talked about earlier in the context of World War II and of the Israeli army. The determination of George Bush and Tony Blair to invade Iraq in 2003 and the distorting influence that those national leaders exercised upon the intelligence machine is well known. And to this very day, all too often, our national leaders adopt courses based upon culpable misreading of evidence. When David Cameron told the House of Commons last November that 70,000 so-called Syrian moderates were waiting impatiently to fight alongside the West against both ISIS and President Assad, I did not then and do not now know one person in the military or intelligence communities who supported such a view. Willfully or otherwise, our Prime Minister allowed himself to think what he wanted to. If such a careless, sometimes even reckless mindset operates in government, then the best intelligence in the world won't help us. We must challenge and resist wishful thinking at every turn. To revert to my Israeli friend at the outset, lie to others if we must, but not to ourselves. I might today have sought to entertain you by telling tales of Bletchley Park and Stalin's astounding World War II spy machine, but I rather fancy that any of you are sufficiently interesting, you might go out and get my book and you can read it there. So I thought you might find it a little more profitable if today, instead, I related the history that I've written to some of the problems of the present day. I'd like to finish by emphasizing that amid all the threats and problems, I'm an impenitent optimist. Experience suggests that most things in life turn out less well than we hope, but less badly than we fear. I'm confident that the West can defeat the threat posed by Muslim extremism because our social, economic, and cultural values are incomparably superior to those of the death cults of ISIS and Al-Qaeda and, for that matter, those of successor movements that will surely arise to trouble us. But to defend our society and the nation's vital interests, we shall need to empower our spooks, geeks, and thugs, if that last isn't too brutal a word to use about the SAS, to protect us at some admitted cost in personal privacy and liberty. The balance of tactics and loyalties in struggles between nations and cultures has changed, is changing, and will continue to change. Secret war, as it was practiced by the nations that fought the 1939-45 struggle, will almost certainly prove to be future war. Thank you all very much. In 1941, my father co-signed, together with Alan Turing, Hugh Alexander, and Gordon Welchman, a letter directly to Winston Churchill, going over the heads of their superiors, appealing for more resources. Sorry. <clears throat> my father was delegated by this group to deliver the letter to Churchill by hand, and even though he realized en route that he had forgotten to bring any identification, he managed to gain admission to 10 Downing Street and deliver the letter personally to Churchill's private secretary. The four codebreakers were rewarded the very next day with Churchill's famous stamp, Action This Day. And 
After that, so they say, things went much more smoothly at Bletchley Park. So I would like to thank Sir Max once again for giving me the opportunity to share this footnote to history. If anybody didn't know it already, um, that your, your father was one of the absolutely tiring figures of Bletchley Park. And what is absolutely, there's no doubt, I've said in my book that um, what happened at Bletchley Park, they were, it was one of the most remarkable assemblies of brain power that the world has ever seen. It's absolutely astounding. And it is actually, the British, one of the things I've said about Britain in the Second World War, I've often been very rude about the British Army, which we have to face the fact the British Army was not as good as the German Army, even on a, on a good day. And um, a lot of the time, was not as good as the Japanese Army either. But on the other hand, Britain as a nation made war much better than, thank goodness, than the, um, than the fascist nations made war. And one of the reasons was because of this business that I touched on in what I said of empowering civilians. And here you have your father, a, a champion chess player. Um, he played for England, I think, didn't he? And uh, who suddenly, with all these, uh, all these other extraordinary people from Oxbridge, they're put there. And they realized, to give an example, I wrote a chapter, Hitler had his own Bletchley Parks, but they weren't as good. And one reason was that um, Germany was combed also for professors. They suffered a good deal from the fact that obviously um, they denied themselves some of the most brilliant men in Germany because they weren't allowed to recruit any Jews. But they did recruit some very clever mathematicians in Germany, but they insisted on putting them all into uniform as lance corporals. And all these very distinguished professors of mathematics in Germany were not happy to find themselves being conscripted into the German army as lance corporals and treated, uh, to put it politely, not very well. The brilliant thing that the British did at Bletchley Park, they realized they were dealing with all these erratic geniuses, and they allowed them to go on being their tweedy selves and to be eccentric and to behave weirdly. And they got a terrific result as a, as out of it as a result. Anyway, it's a great pleasure to see you here today. Yeah, um, over there on the, the end there. Um, uh, uh, do you have any recommendations on how the UK could attract the brightest and best to join G GCHQ? Because, um, as you quite rightly say, there's a dearth of that talent mm -hmm. in cybersecurity, and corporates are giving big bucks to the brightest. Mm -hmm. So what can we do? To I think I think money is going to have to play a part. That at the moment, um, that the quality, who you can recruit to the Joint Intelligence Committee staff, the Joint Intelligence staff in London, is very much dictated by civil service pay scales. And the Second World War, you could appeal to everybody's national spirit to leave whatever they were doing. In fact, not only appeal to the national spirit, you you had conscription. And if you didn't go and work at Bletchley Park, you were going to find yourself um, um, sitting in the Western Desert in a foxhole with a, um, a rifle and bayonet. So um, you had access, um, compulsory access, to all the brightest and best. Well, these days, in the new world, you don't have compulsory access. I do think one's going to have to take some very um, drastic action to try and make sure that you do have access to very clever people in these key roles, because the as I said earlier, um, from here on in, it's perfectly obvious, it's not going to be about spitfires or, for that matter, tornadoes. What's going to matter is the quality of people working in intelligence. And you ain't going to get them if you pay them 50000 a year because it's just not enough um, to get really clever people doing it. Yeah, anybody else? I saw out the back, there's one. Oh, sorry. Um, Martin Mertz, FCC member. I'm curious to see, uh, to hear your take on whistleblowers because they presented a lot of truths that were rather uncomfortable for governments. I can, I can only say, when one says whistleblowers, um, it's a straight choice that, um, for example, the Guardian view of Edward Snowden um, is that um, Edward Snowden, for those of you who don't know, worked for the National Security Agency in America and decamped to Moscow, from which he's um, published a very large number of the secrets of NSA and British eavesdropping. Uh, and he's been variously treated as a whistleblower who is making a heroic stand for civil liberties, or um, as um, a traitor to his country. 
what we can say beyond any doubt is that Snowden's revelations have made it much more difficult. There is clear evidence since Snowden's stuff was published that um, our terrorists both in Europe and in the Middle East are using much more sophisticated encryption systems which they're able to buy off the shelf from Apple and Google and so on and so forth. And um, this is making things far more difficult. Now, you know, I have good friends on both sides of the Atlantic who passionately believe, I, I was talking to one of them in America only a couple of weeks ago, who passionately believes that Snowden was a sort of hero who would well serve the cause of personal liberties. I'm afraid I'd take a different view that I think in time of, in, as I said at the beginning of one of my remarks earlier on, different generations have to make different sacrifices. And we're not being asked to get out there and fight. But I think we are going to have to accept some loss. Um, I worry far more, I'm not being facetious here, about what um, Amazon and Tesco know about my personal affairs from studying my accounts online than I worry about MI5. I don't want to sound facetious about it, but as far as I'm concerned, MI5 can listen to my telephone conversations as often as they like. I didn't, not a problem. But I do see that some people, and I frequently argue with some of them, um, some people do believe that what's going on, that this, uh, this uh, eavesdropping on this scale, it does represent an intolerable affront to personal liberty. But on the other hand, the fact that um, not one of these the plots of the sort of 20 or 30 major plots that have been detected in Britain since 7-7 um, have been detected by um, uh, police work or by um, uh, informants in the Muslim community. They've overwhelmingly been detected by electronic interception. And as I said, I can't for the life of me see how else you can expect to find these people. Um, so nobody in their right mind could say that that eavesdropping on the scale that it's being done both by the NSA and GCHQ is a good thing. But I would turn it on its head and say to the critics, well, um, if not by these means, then how? And yes, I think the so-called whistleblowers, um, I'm afraid I think Snowden has done an awful lot of harm. And I'm only grateful he didn't work at Bletchley Park. Yeah. I wondered if you, in your opinion, you thought GCHQ was still listening into number stations, and if so... Sorry, listening into Number stations. Yeah. And if so, whether number stations were now the tool of international terrorism. I don't know. Um, I always try not to... Uh, to I mean, GCHQ, um, one of the most... As I paid a visit there, not that they don't sort of let one in every 10 minutes, but they have people like me about every, every every 10 years. And I went a few weeks ago, and it is extraordinary that you go through the basement there. They've got, I think it's five acres of computers. You walk down these lines and lines of computers that are all just listening to um, everything under the sun. Um, I just don't know the answer to the question about whether they are explicitly, but I'm surprised that they weren't. Um, but, I, can't, I just can't see any other way. That I, I think my main worry about GCHQ is the one they referred to. They find it incredibly difficult to recruit people of the caliber to do the work analyzing this stuff because the British educational system, as many of you will be thoroughly aware, mathematics is not its strongest suit. And it's proving very hard to find people with the necessary mathematical skills. Yeah. Um, Steve Vines, can I ask you, I, I don't know whether you've seen this, but there's this Israeli documentary, which I think in English is called The Gatekeepers. Which, yeah, oh, brilliant documentary. Brilliant documentary, which, just for people who haven't seen it, is about, yeah. it's interviews basically with the directors of Israeli intelligence. But my question is, in these interviews, wall to wall, you hear from these very, very high-level intelligence people, a narrative of the Israel-Palestine conflict, which is totally... At variance with that of the Israeli government. And I'm just wondering, is that a peculiar Israeli thing, or is it in your experience that these intelligence people have what might be described as a wholly more realistic... Well, the key point, for any of you who haven't seen it, it's worth spending 10 quid on getting, getting it from um, Amazon. It's a documentary called The Gatekeeper. What it is, it's simply long interviews with six former heads of the Shin Bet, the Israeli intelligence service, in which they describe 
they're bitterly critical. The things they're bitterly critical of um, is the fact that because the Israeli government has had no credible policy for anything resembling peace um, for many years now, that essentially the Israeli government have washed their hands have simply told the intelligence services and the army to just get on with holding down the Palestinians by any means they can. Um, and the result is that um, terrible things have been done without anybody really attempting to restrain them. And one of them says in one of the most vivid moments of this film, The, the Gatekeepers, one of the directors of the Shin Bed, he said, occupation has made us a cruel people. And it's, it wouldn't be, if anybody in this room said it, it wouldn't matter sixpence, but it's scary when you hear that being said by a head of director of Israeli intelligence. Um, I have a feeling related to this, which does extend to um, British and American intelligence, that while on the whole I'm prepared to give a lot of latitude to our government's eavesdropping activities, I'm much more worried about um, uh, the use of drones and the whole business of targeted killings. That even though there's not much doubt that quite a lot of the people being, uh, who have been killed by drones are um, not good guys, to put it mildly, just as is happening in Israel, at the same time, I think it is a very, very dangerous business to delegate to governments to act um, unilaterally without any judicial process at all, to just kill whoever they feel like outside their own frontiers. And I often ask the question, if the Chinese or Russian governments started doing this sort of thing to their perceived state enemies, how would we feel? And we would feel very unhappy. Uh, and it seemed to me that one of the lessons from the gatekeepers is that the way that the Israeli army and, um, and Israeli intelligence feel able to kill more or less whoever they decide unilaterally represents a threat to Israel. Um, is very scary. And what was striking is in the film it becomes plain that a good many of the former heads of Israeli intelligence uh, worry about this too. And I feel uneasy. There's a phrase about this whole thing of killing by drones. Only three nations are currently heavily involved in killing by drones. At the moment, it's the Israelis, the Americans, and the British. But other people and terrorists are going to develop this technology. And when terrorists do, we're not going to like it. And the military have a phrase called pred porn, predator pornography. And what they mean by that is that nowadays it becomes terribly seductive for politicians and prime ministers and presidents to sit in their operations room and see on giant screens live feeds of um, drones and cameras tracking s bad guys um, out there in the middle of whether it's Syria or Iraq or Yemen or whatever it may be and just to give the word, um, um, OK, you can kill him, and the Hellfire missile is launched and he's vaporized before their eyes. And the military call it pred porn, predator pornography. And I feel, as a citizen, um, a, a deep unease about this business of targeted killings um, that I don't feel about, um, about surveillance. Uh, that, as I say, when the other side start doing it to us, we're not going to like it. Yeah. Uh, Peter Crawwell, um, do you not uh, have any sympathy at all with Apple's point of view uh, with not wishing to accede to the FBI's requests? If they had, I mean, it may be a moot point now, of course, but if they had, what would the implications be for companies in Russia, China, and so on? Well, in Russia and China, as we know, um, that companies are already... Um, no company operating inside Russia or China would be allowed to um, withhold information that was useful to the authorities for any purpose. But again, I, I come back to this. Nobody can say it's a good thing um, that privacy is um, constantly being violated as it is. But this is the world in which we live. And what I find scary about these high-tech companies, Apple, Google, and so on and so forth, they act in so many respects, not least about taxation, as if they were above the law and as if they had no national allegiance. It's the lack of any sense of national allegiance. And for Apple to say that they have a duty to their customers, which, uh, which is a higher duty than their duty to um, the country, I think is very scary. But I'd be the first to say, um, I've just spent three weeks in America, and a good many of my liberal friends on the West Coast um, totally disagree with me and very strongly support Apple. 
But there are two reasons for that. One is that there's a deep legacy of mistrust of the US government dating back to the Vietnam War era. When um, in the Vietnam War era, um, Johnson and then much more Nixon um, syst systematically abused the instruments of the US government, notably including the FBI, to persecute anti-war protesters and to discredit uh, critics of the government. And that legacy persists today. And so there is a deep unwillingness on the United States. There's no willingness to give the benefit of that. And I think also they feel more remote from the threat. I don't think they feel we, in the light of especially recent events, feel very, very close to the terrorist threat. And there's no doubt you have to keep... The point is what view you take about security versus privacy, versus personal liberty. This is not a constant or an absolute. It's something you have to keep reviewing in the light of circumstances. And um, I think in the light of recent terrorist attacks um, in Europe, you have to be, uh, to be willing to tilt the balance in favor of the authorities and surveillance. But as all I can say to you is that uh, quite a lot of my American friends would disagree with me very strongly, and they strongly support Apple against the US government. Yeah. Jake Vanderkamp, South China Morning Post. You say, um, if not this, how? What about not joining the United States quite so enthusiastically on every single war it uses to fight on flimsy pretexts in the Middle East? Well, there I would totally agree with you. Uh, that, but I don't think um, what one has to remember. I mean, I was a very strong opponent of both the Iraq war and the Libyan intervention, and for that matter, of intervention in Syria three years ago. But that said, I don't think we should kid ourselves. You're dealing with different things. Yes, I think it, these were vast errors, which have cost us very dearly. But on the other hand, ISIS is, is a movement which hates us all and is bent on our destruction, quite irrespective of what we do or don't do with. And for example, any idea that by being nicer to ISIS, that I mean, there seems to be no basis for trapping with them at all. And as for the, I mean, the Belgians have done absolutely nothing to assist any Western coalition war effort in recent years, and yet look what has been done to them on Monday. Um, so I don't disagree with your point um, that I think our handling of foreign policy towards the, um, the in the Middle East has been lamentable since uh, certainly since 2002. Um, but on the other hand, we are now. We have to look at where we are now, and um, ISIS is. I don't believe we can traffic with ISIS. Do you? But, um, yeah, we must be nearly running out of time, but I think, um, Clip, one, what do you think? One more. One time for, time for one more question. Yeah. yeah. Sorry. I, I've got the microphone, so I'm lucky. Uh, David Lawrence, associate member. Um, here in Hong Kong, we all have to have Hong Kong identity cards. And my question to you is, do you think it would be a good idea for people in Europe also Particularly, particularly the United Kingdom, also to have identity cards? Um, I believe so, yes. Um, I think where I think there's any logic is that a lot of the same right-wingers in Britain especially, who were violently opposed to, to identity cards, are also violently opposed to immigration, especially illegal immigration. And there seems to me no possibility whatever of um, controlling or limiting immigration. Um, in the absence of identity cards. So I think we're going to have to have them. And again, I feel that's a price we're going to have to pay. But what always happens at the moment is that um, is the governments are trailing way, way behind events. And I suspect that um, the British government in particular will come around to identity cards um, far, far too late in the game, and probably not for some years, because there's very, very strong right-wing um, libertarian opposition to them. Um, although, again, I don't. We're all our, all our details, there's so much of it on file with so many different organizations. When you think of all the stuff that banks and all the people we shop with know about it, I mean, I think Amazon know almost everything about the personal habits of almost everybody in this room, but uh, <laughs> certainly they do about mine. <laughs> <laughs> um, anyway, thank you all very much indeed for being such a very nice audience and coming along, and it's a huge pleasure to be back here in Hong Kong. And, um, I can see the Foreign, Foreign Correspondents Club hasn't changed a bit, thanks to all of you.